We're continuing to read through the, bu- the book of Acts, looking specifically at all of the different gospel proclamations that we find there. And remember, what I'd like you guys to be listening for as we go through this is to see the, the commonalities, the things that are present every single time the gospel is preached in the book of Acts. Today it's the, one of the shorter passages we'll read, but we'll start in Acts 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who'd heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." Now they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would use our class time today to motivate us for evangelism, to make us more really passionate and more obedient to what your scriptures call of us. Lord, help us live out your expectations help us live out our purpose. Help us love our neighbors as you have loved us. And help us be faithful in bringing them the news of salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last class there were uh, a couple questions at the end of class that uh, I wanted to address uh, I'll do one now and then I'll do one later as we're going through. While I'm answering this, you can find in your syllabus the motivation of evangelism. That's the section we're going to look at today, the motivation of evangelism. It's the first time the word motivation is used in your syllabus, if you just search for that, the motivation of evangelism. At the end of class, a couple of people came and brought to me uh, Professor Montoya's syllabus from a uh, his PM class, where as I have a line in the syllabus I gave you that said evangelism is the the main function of the church and it's the uh, the chief purpose of the church. He has the exact same line in his syllabus except with the word no in front of it. Um, Evangelism is not (laughs) the main function of the church. And uh, I do think that those two, having read the context of his comments and and spoken to some good spies I have in that class, Uh, I think those two statements are uh, able to be harmonized. When Montoya is talking about the church on Sunday morning, uh, when he's talking about the evangelism is not the main function of the church, the context of that comment in his syllabus and in class was about the Sunday morning gathering of the church. And it was in the context of him talking about having a biblical ministry versus seeker-sensitive ministry, meaning that Sunday morning, you're not gathered church corporate for the purpose of evangelism. Sunday morning, you're gathered church corporate for the purpose of training and equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry for uh, worship and praise and uplifting and all those other things. However, when I'm saying that evangelism is the chief function of the church, I'm not talking the Sunday morning gathering. I'm talking about in God's redemptive plan, in the meta-narrative of Scripture, in what God is doing in the world during this des- dispensation, how God has, has called the church out and what he's sent them out into the world to do. That's why I think evangelism is the chief function of God. It is the chief purpose of God. I'm talking about from Pentecost to the rapture. That's, that's my vision of what I'm saying 
uh, when I say that God is primarily concerned with evangelism, when I say that the church's main function in the world is evangelism, not, not worship, not prayer, not guarding the truth, I'm speaking not of the Sunday morning 9.30, 10.30 service. I'm speaking of what God has called Christians in the church to be doing in this age. So I think they do harmonize, but I'll leave the details to you guys. Any other questions on that before we move on? There were some other questions I got at the end of class about uh, evangelism, and I think the gentleman who asked it is not, not here, but he was there last class, unless he's hiding now, about the Great Commission being given just to the disciples and just to the apostles, but we'll look at that later on today. So the motivation of evangelism, that's what I want to look at this morning. What motivates us for evangelism? I want to begin with this quote from Vance Havner. He says, evangelism is to Christianity what veins are to our bodies. You can cut Christianity anywhere, and it'll bleed evangelism. Evangelism is vascular. It's our business. Talk about majoring on evangelism. You might as well talk about a doctor majoring on healing. That's our business. I love this quote because it captures to me what I think the, the heartbeat is, not just of God for the world, but of Christians for their neighbors. If you call yourself a Christian, what you're saying is that you're called out from the world for the purposes of Christ, and what Christ is doing is reaching the world with the gospel. So this really gets to the question about why we should evangelize. What is our motivation for evangelism? Or to make it more pastoral, as a pastor, how do you motivate the people in your congregation for the purpose of evangelism? Because really, in most Christians' lives, they run, their emotions run on a continuum from nervousness to fear. <laughs> That's how they approach evangelism. You might find the, the occasional exception who's, who's all gung-ho and knocking on doors 24-7. But the majority of the people in your congregation will find themselves somewhere between nervous and afraid when it comes to evangelism. Beyond that, we live in a, a society, a, a, a contemporary age of Christianity, where theologians don't evangelize. And evangelists are not theologians. Have you noticed that trend? The result of that is that most of our evangelists don't know theology. And most of our theologians have developed their theology in isolation of, of what God is doing in the world. I think in order to properly motivate your people for evangelism, you have to understand the difference between motivation and manipulation. You have to understand the difference between motivation and manipulation. I can manipulate your emotions. I could tell you like a really sad story about a guy, you know, one of my neighbors who was struck by lightning and, and, and died in my arms and I, you know, I could start crying and I, I squandered every moment of my life to, to give him the gospel and I just wasted it and, and now he's gone. And I, I, if I put some effort into it, I could make a pretty good story that could get a tear or two out of some of you, I think. Maybe not the most hardened of you, but I bet I could get a few tears. I could tell a story about evangelism being uh, the equivalent of having a, a cure that can fight cancer and this person who has the cure and they're keeping it in their pocket and the whole world is dying because you know, they're afraid that if their son gets injured, they want that cure in their pocket. Those are true stories from books on evangelism I've read recently, true illustrations that people use to try to motivate people for evangelism. Those kind of manipulations fail though. They might produce short-term results, but they don't produce a long-term impact. If you try to manipulate people to participate in any activity in your church, manipulation can produce a short-term result, but it won't have a long-term impact. You, can, you need more children's workers. You can herd you know, second-grade kids up on the stage crying about how their awana gets canceled because you want to go to lunch after church on Sunday instead of serving them. And you can get a few volunteers. But often pastors try the same approach towards evangelism, sob stories and, and just emotional manipulation. And that kind of approach doesn't produce results. I could try to manipulate your time. Perhaps you've heard evangelism is the only thing you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. Have any of you guys heard that? Um, I'm not persuaded that's entirely true. I think of things like, I don't know, fasting, repenting, restoring, forgiving, confronting, preaching. Um, I have a, a whole long list of things in my mind that you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. That kind of manipulation doesn't make people evangelists. Pastor John has this quote, any manipulation in evangelism 
may produce short-term results, but in the long run becomes a barrier to genuine belief. And in the context of this comment, he's not talking about manipulating somebody to become a Christian. He's talking about manipulating people to go out and spread the gospel. When people are dispatched into the mission field, when they're dispatched into their community through the means of manipulation, it actually becomes a barrier to them producing converts. It becomes a barrier to genuine belief. So the question becomes, what is a proper motivation for evangelism? What becomes a proper motivation? And I think the answer really is one word. The one word answer about what our proper motivation for evangelism is, is obedience. The difference between manipulation and motivation is coming to understand evangelism in the terms of obedience. To be an evangelist is a command. Regardless about how you feel about it, regardless about how you're gifted for it, it's a command. And by the way, it's not a command that's fulfilled with the occasional preaching of an evangelistic sermon. I started with the quote from, from Moody Bible because I want that to be the umbrella under which we look at the motivation for evangelism. Christianity should be about evangelism. It should be about evangelism. It comes down, frankly, to an issue of obedience. Are you going to obey those kind of commands? I want you to look with me at 2 Corinthians 5. You can flip there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is one of the, the more clear places where this is described in Scripture. Not the only clear place, but I think one of the more clear places places. This is one of those passages where it's difficult to find the right starting point. But if you look at verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And even if you look at verse 9, we're of good courage. We'd rather be, uh, verse 8, rather be away from the body to be at home with the Lord, looking forward to death, Paul says. So, verse 9, whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. Why does Paul make it his aim to please God while he's here on earth, away from the Lord? He says that in verse 10, because he's anticipating the day where he will stand before Christ for judgment. Paul's looking forward to the Bema seat judgment. Beam is the, the Greek word here for, for judgment seat. Paul's looking forward to the Bema seat judgment of Christ so that he can receive what his reward is for his life of obedience. And then look at verse 11. Therefore, and the therefore connects you to Paul's fear of judgment. The therefore connects you to Paul knowing that he himself, the apostle Paul, will stand before God to be rewarded for his faithfulness in life. And that gives him, in verse 11, the fear of the Lord. And I don't want you to miss that. Paul says that he has the fear of God because he's anticipating his judgment from God. And obviously this is not the judgment between heaven and hell. Paul does not have that fear in him. He's not looking forward to that. Paul says in verse 10, he's looking forward to being rewarded for how he lived in his life. And he says because of that, he has the fear of the Lord. And because he has that fear, look at his response to persuade others. Paul's motivation for persuading others is knowing that he will be judged for how faithful he was at the task. And that's why he says, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it's known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you. Again, some people will approach this verse and say, Paul's talking about the fear of judgment between heaven and hell, and that's why he's persuading others. But that just doesn't make sense in context. Paul's talking about himself standing before God for judgment. Verse 12, he's talking about whether or not he's commending himself for how he's being faithful in this task. He's always concerned about what the heart is. Verse 13, he's back to himself again. If we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. And then again, he says the same thing. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. 
For Paul, the Bema Seat Judgment, the primary motivation that he gets for evangelism is from the Bema Seat Judgment. When he looks forward to standing before God to be rewarded for how he lives, his primary application of that is how he will evangelize in his own life. That's why he says in verse 16, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. For Paul, it comes down to evangelism. Let's get down to verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. The primary motivation for evangelism is obedience. And underlying that is this concept that God will judge us for how obedient we were. God will reward us for our faithfulness. And that seems primarily to be seen in our faithfulness to evangelism. This command is seen in a couple different ways. It's seen in a qualitative sense. There's a qualitative aspect of this command to evangelize. I'm thinking specifically of the Great Commission here. There's a qualitative element of it. Look at the quality of what we're supposed to do in evangelism. We're supposed to make disciples. We're supposed to baptize them. We're supposed to teach them. And we're supposed to send them. The gentleman's question last week about if the Great Commission was given just to the apostles or just to, or, or to the church in general for, for the rest of the church age, I answered it with a strange answer about hermeneutics and repeated four times. But I think this is even a better answer, looking at what the content of it actually is. The content of the Great Commission is we're supposed to make disciples, baptize them, teaching them, and sending them. And what are we supposed to teach them? Do you remember? Everything that Jesus commanded them. And in the context, what's, what's the nearest, closest antecedent? What's the last thing Jesus commanded them? To go into all the world, right? So Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. The most recent of which is to go into all the world and make disciples. It's a self-perpetuating command. Obviously, it exhausts itself beyond the apostle's life just because of the nature of it. It repeats itself over and over and over again. But also, there's a quantitative element of it. There's a quantitative element of it. Not just qualitative, but quantitative. You're sent into the whole world. Into the whole world. And Jesus says, he's with us until the end of the age. Which is another strong reason to not see it as ending with the, the apostles. Because Jesus says it goes and carries on until the end of the age. So when you're thinking of how the Great Commission applies to Christians in general, there's a qualitative and a quantitative aspect to it. Christians are supposed to be making disciples of all men, teaching them, baptizing them, sending them into the whole world until the end of the age. But there's also an element of this that's specific to pastors. And if you would, flip in your, your Bibles over to 2 Timothy. I've got the specific verse on the screen, but I, I want you to see the, the context of this verse, what's, what's all around it. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And even you can look at the end of chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3.16. Again, this is a pastoral epistle. Paul is instructing Timothy in terms of being a pastor. And he tells Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. And we, we all get that context. We all get because the word of God is living and active, because the word of God is breathed out by God, because the word of God is profitable, because the word of God is fit for proof, correction, training, pastors are supposed to preach it. We understand that. We're supposed to be ready in season and out of season to always be using the word of God. But if you skip down to verse 5, this is the same flow. I mean, we can keep reading through it, actually. Verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll turn away from listening to the truth, wander into myths. Verse 5, but for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. 
Fulfill your ministry. It's very interesting to me that in Paul's instructions to Timothy, this is the pinnacle of it. That's where the argument ends. Verse 6, Paul sw switches gears and turns back to his own life, looking back on his own life. The whole argument that starts in chapter 3 and goes, it starts at the very beginning of chapter 3 and goes all the way through 4 or 5 has its pinnacle in Timothy being an evangelist. Paul makes this impassioned plea for how powerful the word of God is. Therefore, Timothy should preach it. But more than just preaching it, Paul says, do the work of an evangelist so that you fulfill your ministry. If you take out the do the work of the evangelist and you have preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, you're not fulfilling your ministry. It's fascinating to me that when Paul looks at the role of a pastor, he sees it incomplete if evangelism is absent. I mean, think of all the other works he could have, he could have put there. Preach the word and be faithful to love those in your congregation so that you fulfill your ministry. Preach the word and be faithful in, in prayer so that you can fulfill your ministry. But he chose to do the work of an evangelist. And that's also interesting to me because earlier, Paul offsets evangelism, having the gift of evangelism, from having the gift of being a pastor or a teacher. Right? He made some apostles, some, some pastors, and some evangelists. So in Paul's mind, a pastor is not the same thing as having the office of an evangelist. Someone who's gifted to be a pastor is not necessarily gifted to be an evangelist. That's Paul's worldview right there. Paul's ecclesiology, when he looks at pastors, they are not the same people who are gifted as evangelists. That's the grid that Paul's working in. But nevertheless, Paul says that a pastor is not fulfilling or completing his ministry unless he's doing the work of an evangelist. Timothy is not called an evangelist, by the way. Only one person in the New Testament is called an evangelist, and that's Philip. And Philip's not called a pastor. Philip's not told to do the work of a pastor because he's an evangelist. It's a one-way street. Pastors are supposed to do the work of the ministry. They're supposed to preach the word. They're supposed to be ready in season and out of season. But they're not supposed to stop or consider their ministry fulfilled until they do the work of an evangelist. So, there's some other things, other verses I want to look at before we go on to the next part of your outline. If you're with me so far, if you're buying into what I'm saying, that evangelism is a call given to Christians, it's characteristic that if believers love God, they obey God. Think of 1 John 5, 3. Or John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not only that, but if you love God, you'll also love others. Think of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 44. You're supposed to love unbelievers. You're supposed to love your enemy as God loves the world. If God can ha cause the rain to fall on your next door neighbor, is Jesus' point in Matthew 5, 44. If he can cause the rain to fall on the guy next to you, you can love him and you can bring him the gospel. 1 John 4.19 says we love God because he first loved us. And think about that in John's theology of love. John, think of John 15. John has this idea that comes from Jesus that God the Father loves the Son. The way that God the Father loves the Son is the way that the Son loves his disciples and loves the church. That same love that God has for his Son, that his Son has for the church, is the love that the church is supposed to have for each other. And because of that love, we're supposed to love our enemies because God loves his enemies. Understand that this makes evangelism an issue of obedience. There's no excuses or no exceptions given to these commands in the New Testament. Paul doesn't say do the work of an evangelist as long as you feel equipped and capable and moved by the moment. Think of the most uh, common excuses you hear why people don't evangelize. Oh, well, 
in your situation, it might be, I'm in seminary. <laughs> but in churches, what people often say is, I don't evangelize because I'm shy, I'm timid, I'm not mature enough yet. I need to, I need to learn more. Yeah, I'll evangelize in the future. When I hit retirement age, that's when I can be focused on evangelism. People may be afraid of evangelism, but that fear is an opportunity to trust God for courage. People may be naive about it, but that naivete is an opportunity to trust God for wisdom. People can be timid, but as a pastor, you teach your people when you're timid, you trust God for confidence. Knowing that if you obey him, you will glorify him. When you obey God's commands, you give God glory. Because in the very practical way, when you obey God's commands, what you're illustrating is that you value and you love God and your obedience to God more than you love your own comfort. And that glorifies God. It ascribes worth to God. When you choose to trust God and follow him, You're giving him glory by showing that you value him over your own comfort in the things of the world. There's perhaps no other area of obedience that's more evident in than evangelism. You value your own comfort, you value your own life more than you value other people's lives, more than you value the gospel in their life. When you think like that, you're not giving God glory. But when you change your thinking to saying, I value the gospel more than my own time, my own comfort, my own agenda, my own schedule, that glorifies God. We've all had the experience, or at least I have it often, of pulling in my parking spot at my apartment at the end of the day, getting out of the car. Here's my neighbor, not that neighbor, but the annoying neighbor, now going to walk in to our apartment complex and he starts a conversation and I called my wife 15 minutes ago, told her I'm on my way home. I'm in the parking spot. My wife is right behind that door and my neighbor is out here wanting to talk to me. At that moment, the issue becomes, what do I value more? Is it more important for me to stay on schedule and go home and see my wife or do I value the gospel and the opportunity to deliver it to this person more. Do you see how in a very practical way being faithful in evangelism glorifies God by ascribing more worth to the glory of the gospel than to your own agenda? The person who's timid glorifies God when he trusts God for boldness by believing the glories of the gospel are valued more than his own sense of confidence and sense of safety. That's why Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did with you. As the word of God spreads, God is glorified. Not only through the evangelist giving glory to God through evangelism, but through people then believing the gospel. God's glory is magnified. We talked about that last week. We glorify God by evangelizing, not only because evangelizing is an act of obedience, but also because in evangelism we tell the world what great things God has done for the salvation of sinners. Well, because the command to evangelize is so clear in Scripture, if you don't evangelize, I think one of three things are going on. And you could add maybe to this list on your own, but these are the three most common reasons people don't evangelize. One, they have a greater fear of man than God. And that's probably the most common reason. People fear man more than they fear God. Which was the opposite of Paul's thought in 2 Corinthians 5, right? He says, because I fear God so much, I'm going to spend my life proclaiming the gospel to people. It's just 2 Corinthians 5, I feel bad leaving it behind, but there's so much depth in there. Paul says, because he fears God, he's going to be an evangelist. Because he fears God, he's going to stand there with his mouth open to these people, he says in chapter 6. He's going to stand there with his mouth and his heart open. And these weren't the friendly neighbors. (laughs) These are the people that had closed their hearts to Paul, that had abused Paul, that had spread lies about Paul, that probably would have killed him if given the chance. And Paul says, because he fears God, he's going to be faithful in bringing them the gospel. Anyway, a greater fear of man than God. Another possible reason. Some people have developed a pattern of not applying the commands of Scripture to their life. 
It's kind of this any meeny miny mo approach to sanctification. I like this command, I'll follow it. I don't like this command, I won't follow it. And it's amazing how easy it is to develop this pattern of thinking in your life. Once you provide an excuse to yourself for not following a command of God, it's just a pattern that will be seen everywhere else in your life. I guarantee you if somebody says, I don't evangelize because that a command does not apply to me, that logic is not limited to evangelism. That logic is seen in other areas of their life. I don't evangelize because I don't apply that command. I also don't have to hate materialism because I don't apply that command. I don't have to love my neighbor as I love myself because I don't have to apply that command. It's going to be a pattern that shows up all over the place. Or thirdly, ultimately they have a heart that's disobedient. They don't give the gospel because they don't know the gospel. They're not obedient to Christ because they're not obedient to Christ in any area. Think about any fight against sin. You can't manipulate your own sanctification. Your sanctification hinges on you being obedient to God's commands. The same is true with evangelism. You can't manipulate yourself into evangelizing more. But once you see evangelism as an issue of obedience, if you're a Christian, your heart would delight in that obedience. I think the way you produce an attitude of evangelism in your church is teaching your people that evangelism is an issue of obedience. That it comes down to being obedient to what God has commanded them to do. Are there any questions on that section? Motivation of evangelism. Yeah. Uh, but yes, Pastor. Are you going to hear this? Sure. I want to hear your response. God's called me to live quietly and work with my own hands. Uh-huh. And, uh, I'm always ready to give a defense, but I, I can't come door to door this weekend. Or uh, I'm not into passing out tracks. You know, they'll fire me at work. Sure. So I, I want to pray for the kings and stuff, but I'm going to live quietly. And if somebody engages me, then then I'll share it with them. How do you respond to that kind of Christian? Yeah, the question is, how do you respond to the Christian who says, look, God has called me to live quietly and work with my hands. I'm not called to hand out tracts and, and knock on doors. Well, there is some, some very good truth to that statement, and we're going to talk about that maybe even on, on Friday this week. But one of the big enemies of evangelism in the, in the contemporary church, in the American church, even in, in Grace Community Church here, is this idea that evangelism consists of or is part and parcel with handing out tracts and knocking on doors or standing on the street with the bullhorn, right? We've all seen that guy at Roscoe and Van Nuys, at least I see him all the time, literally standing on a pedestal with a bullhorn and a sandwich board sign around his neck, the, you know, in Spanish it says, believe the gospel and read the Bible on it, and he's barking at cars and buses with his bullhorn. Well, people from Grace drive by that guy, they see that and they say, I'm not called to do that kind of evangelism, and that's a short step to I'm not called to do evangelism. And you can't talk somebody into doing that. It's going to be a hard stretch to say that's the kind of evangelism all Christians are called to. You know, pick up your sandwich board sign at the door. It's not going to work. So you have to give them, and I hesitate to use the word, but you have to give your people a more holistic understanding of evangelism. That working quietly and leading a quiet life with their hands is an attribute, an element of evangelism. The, that that motivation behind that is not to stay out of trouble. The motivation behind that is to be a good witness at your work. You know, there's always the false dichotomy between if I give the gospel to the guys I'm working with, I'll get fired. And yeah, if you're on the clock and you're preaching the gospel to the people you're working with, you probably will get fired, and rightfully so. And that's why Paul tells the Thessalonians to work quietly with their hands so they don't bring reproach upon the gospel. Christians should be hard workers. But at the same time, you need to give your people the idea that they need to be developing relationships with their coworkers for the purpose of giving them the gospel. They're not, non-believers aren't lepers. You can develop a friendship with them. It's okay. So work quietly with your hands. Be faithful at work so that you can develop relationships with people and bring them the gospel. So it's a, I think they're just missing the so that. Same question twice from two different people during the break is about God's love for uh, what role the love of God for the unsaved plays in evangelism. Because there is, you know, in one, in one sense, the whole point what I wanted to make the first hour was 
that we evangelize out of obedience to God, out of our, we're Christians, Christians obey God, God tells us to evangelize, so we evangelize. So on paper, the, that's a logically tight uh, reasoning right there. We love God, so we obey God, and God tells us to evangelize, so what's hard to understand about that? But at the same time, there's the emotional element of it as well, uh, that there is, if we love our neighbors, then we should love them as God loves them, right? And so the question comes up that two different people asked during the break is, how does God's love for the unsaved play into our, to our evangelism? So the first thing you really need to establish, this isn't in your notes, this is just for free real quick. The first thing you need to establish is that God does indeed love the, the, the unsaved, that, God, that God's heart is inclined towards compassion towards the unsaved. And I can think of so many different Bible verses that talk about that. The one I referenced at the beginning of, of the class, or the first hour, was Matthew 5, um, 44. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. And just think about that reasoning. Love your enemies so that you can be like your Father. Uh, now, uh, the, the logic that Jesus is using there is pretty clear, uh, how the Jews would have heard that. Love your enemies so that you can be like your father. It makes no sense to say love your enemies so that you can be like your father who doesn't love his enemies. Um, it only works when you say love your enemies so that you can be like your father who indeed loves his enemies. So you have Matthew 5 where Jesus talks about the father loving his enemies. You have John 3 where the, the sacrifice of Christ is rooted in God's love for the world. You have, uh, uh, you have Jesus standing over Jerusalem, you know, almost weeping, talking to these Pharisees, saying, well, to the whole generation of, of Jerusalem, saying how often he would have gathered them together in his arms. It's a very, very tender statement he's speaking of. He even says, like a, like a mother would gather her, her hens. This is a very tender statement that Jesus is speaking of. And he's not speaking even present tense. I think he's talking pre-incarnate in that passage about how the second member of the Trinity, so often through the history of the world, longed to gather Israel together. But they were not willing. They were never willing. Um, you have God's compassion for, for uh, unsaved people seen all throughout Scripture. I think of 1 Samuel 15, where you really see God's compassion for Saul as the kingdom is taken from him so much that the language that Samuel uses or that Yahweh uses to Samuel to describe his heart breaking over the kingdom being torn from Saul is really, really graphic language. Think of Ezekiel, where God compares unsaved Israel it's going to be a tough case to, to make that the people in Israel that God is expressing his love for as a daughter were saved. They, they weren't saved. That's the whole point of Ezekiel. They were rejected and were sent into exile. And yet God speaks of his unending love for them. Think of Jeremiah who weeps over the city that throws him into the, the pit, to the city that he comes upon and is destroyed. It's very much God's compassion for the city that you see through Jeremiah. So there's a lot of other passages that, that I can think of, but especially the Matthew 5 passage makes pretty clear that God has this love for his enemies, and this is the love that Christians are supposed to have for their enemies. And the response to that is not, well, what if your enemies elect? Your response to that is, who, you know, who is my neighbor then? And Jesus' answer is the people who are around you. So any questions on God's, God's love for others before we get into the history of evangelism? Yeah. So when you're sharing the gospel with unsaved people, you have no problem telling them that God loves them. I have no problem telling them that God loves them. And I can base that on a couple things. They're made in the image of God. They have the likeness of God. And if God loves one thing in the world, it's himself. And the very fact that people are in the image of God is the grounds of God's love for, for them. Beyond that, you have uh, the fact that the rain falls on them. They get a sunset. They get a wife. They get all kinds of nice things in the world that are evidences of God's love for them. Um, now, I'm not trying to diminish the distinction between God's love for the people who get rain and God's love for the people who get the gift of repentance, um, but they're both love. You know, I'm commanded to love my neighbor, I'm commanded to love my wife, and I don't love them the same way, and that doesn't make me unloving. Uh, I think the same is true um, with God, because that distinction is rooted in God's love, right? God loves himself, he loves his son, he loves his church, he loves his children, he loves the world. He loves them all differently, though. Okay, let's look at the history of evangelism. 
Let me just search for the word history. I think it's the first time it's used in your notes, the history of evangelism. And what I want to look at is the first, this morning I want to look at the first three, four hundred years of church history. The first three to four hundred years of the church history. In those first years of church history, the church grew from about 4,000 people in in the book of Acts to about 4.3 million people. And to compare that to the world's population, by the year 450, about 25% of the world would have claimed to be Christian. So again, one more time. If you compare that to population, about 25% of the world in the year 450 would have claimed to be, a, claimed to be Christian. That is a dramatic change from a handful of frightened people in the upper room. So the question that gets asked is, how can we explain or how can we analyze the spread of the church throughout the known world? If you rewind the tape even further, Christ commissioned 11 people to do this work. They were nobodies, by the way, with every odd against them. He didn't commission governors. He didn't commission princes. He commissions, as we just read this morning in Acts 4, people that some of them may have even been illiterate. He commissioned fishermen, and that was the response of the Sadducees. They looked at him and perceived that they were uneducated men. Those are the people that that God chose. And the result of that choosing is that within 400 years, 25% of the world would have called themselves Christians. Humanly speaking, their task was certain to fail. And it obviously, God's sovereignty ensured its success. So I want to look at a couple of the factors that God used in his sovereignty that were what I'm going to call proponents of evangelism. Proponents of evangelism. The first was the Roman peace. The Roman peace. This was the first, the time of Christ in this 300 year period between the time of Christ and the fall of Rome. The time of Christ was the only time in world history that the entire Mediterranean basin was under the control of one government. It's never happened again and it you know, may never happen again. It's unparalleled in history. People may have complained about Roman rule, but it ensured that all of Northern Africa, what we consider the Middle East, Asia, Southern Europe all had one government. And it was a peaceful government too. They expanded through conquest and brutality, but they maintained an order which, which gave rise to Roman peace. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but the timing of Christ's entrance into the world was impeccable. Even the location, Christopher Wright in his book, The Mission of God, talks about how even the location of Israel was chosen for the same purpose. Israel was strategically located to be a light to the nations in a part of the world where all the continents could see her. Christ came to that part of the world at the only time in world history when it was all united. Rome had just spent 53 years subjugating the the furthest extent of the Roman Empire. When Jesus came, there was 100 years of peace the only time in really Roman history that there were no civil wars. Rome maintained order and peace throughout the empire. The entire Mediterranean basin was under one government. Society was synchronized. And what I mean by synchronization of society was even basic things like currency, language, citizenship, which the book of Acts makes much of. It's very interesting to see how the Lord used the, the one disciple with Roman citizenship to bring the gospel to Rome. Society was synchronized. People had the ability to travel freely throughout the society. Just think, for example, right now, about how much the face of missions has changed in the last 25, 30 years. You know, right now, you could, if money was not an issue, get up from this classroom in Sun Valley where you all are, drive to LAX, and get to literally anywhere in the world in 24 hours. There's no place that's out of reach for you. 
Think about that, how, how that has changed the face of missions in the last 25, 30 years. Even, even 100 years ago, to get to most of the world, the missionaries got on a boat and they were gone. They could take a furlough every 10, 15 years. Now missionaries can maintain relationships with their church. Just think about how drastically the ability to travel around the world has changed missions. Well, rewind the tape even further. When Jesus came to the world, when he came to the Roman Empire, and when he established his church, that was the first time in world history that somebody could travel freely throughout that part of the world, through Africa, through Asia, through Europe. It's really a staggering thing to think about, and that in God's timing, that is when the gospel was delivered there. There was a solidified Greek culture. There was a singular culture. And the obvious effect of that is language. Everybody spoke Greek. Think of Acts 21, 37, when the Roman captain suspected Paul of being an Egyptian and then asked him, you know, with surprise, how do you know Greek? In verse 40. And of course, much has been written about how the Greek language prepared the way for the, the gospel, the significance of the New Testament being written in Greek instead of Aramaic. But elements of that is the thought, the logic, and the reason that's in Greek culture. All these are the perfect foundation for the gospel. Just a, a way of thinking systematically. A way of understanding reason as it relates to God. Religion was solidified. Meaning that there was a certain element of religious freedom. There was diversity in religion, but was, what was solidified was this element of religious freedom. Cults had paved the way through the Roman Empire for people to be familiar with this idea of a religion spreading. Before the Roman Empire, religions didn't proselytize. Religions didn't go knocking on doors. Religions didn't go to the marketplace and try to make converts. That's not the way religions worked. Religions were part and parcel with the government. A religion expanded as the government expanded and conquered people. But the Roman Empire laid the groundwork for this concept in Greek culture of a religion that sought converts to expand. In a sense, the church came to the world at the only time, again, in world history where your religion wasn't a derivative of your culture, your ethnicity. Religion became seen as an element of belief. Did you believe this? Do you believe that? And that became your religion. It's amazing how studying the religion in the Roman Empire, cults are largely to credit for this. The proliferation of cults paved the way for people to have a gospel preached to them. Which makes me want to pause. I think your notes have a, uh, uh, a breakout section here about what exactly a cult is. And I want to look at that real quick. Is that, is that in your guys' notes? Okay. Here's what a cult is. Here's the, here's the uh, sociological definition of a cult. A cult teaches, a cult has three criteria. One, it teaches that it alone has the way of salvation or that it alone has the truth. So there's no such thing as a universalist cult. Does that make sense? In order for something to be a cult, they have to say that they're the only ones that, that have access to the truth. Second, a cult is founded by a charismatic leader who is succeeded by those with complete or infallible authority. So religion without a unified leader doesn't fall under the definition of of a cult. So, a cult has to teach that it alone has the way of salvation, that it's founded, it has to be founded by a charismatic leader who's succeeded by those with complete or infallible authority. And third, it's viewed as outside the norm of society. It's viewed as outside the norm of society. When a religion becomes mainstream, it ceases to be a cult. And that's probably because for a religion to be considered mainstream, it's losing number one, probably. It's no longer holding to strict universalism. So as you, just, as you just look at that list, that's the list pretty much agreed on from non-Christian sources about what the definition of a cult is. That's kind of the world's definition of a cult. If you look at those three reasons, 
you know, my mind immediately goes to present day, what would be considered a cult present day. And when I look at this, you, this is why I wouldn't consider Roman Catholicism a cult. You know, it may meet number one and two, but it's definitely considered part of the norm of our society. I wouldn't consider uh, Islam so much of a cult because, you know, it, it doesn't meet one or two, I don't think, or three really now. We think of Mormonism. Mormonism meets number one and number two, and there's a serious question about if Mormonism would still be considered a cult because of, of number three. It's really becoming part of mainstream American culture, it seems. But well, you guys are free to disagree with that. And there's other stranger religions like Jehovah's Witnesses are still very much can seen outside, outside the norm of society. There's, you know, in LA right now, there's this proliferation of this mother god cult everywhere. Um, they're definitely... <laughs> outside the norm of society. Here's why I think it's important to understand what, a, what a, a cult is, because it affects how you evangelize those people. Let me tell you what makes cults so appealing. This is why people get swept up in a cult. Cults offer the hope of a clear conscience. That's the main thing that cults have going for them. Non-Christians, if you remember from a few classes ago, all non-Christians are living under this active suppression of sin. They have guilt because of their sin. Non-Christians know they're sinful and they have guilt because of it. What cults offer them is the ability to escape that guilt, to give them a clear conscience. And this is nothing new. I mean, this is Catholicism and penance. This is just basic man inventing a system whereby you can get salvation. But because of the uniqueness of a cult, it's usually a very clear cut steps in order to gain that salvation. It's not deny your life, pick up your cross and, and follow me. It's get baptized in this building by this person, wear these clothes, go to this place once a week and you're in. All that for a clear conscience? It's an easy trade for some people. Second, cults offer a deliverance from fate. A deliverance from fate. And this was especially prominent in the Roman Empire. That was the main way that cults expanded in the Roman Empire. Romans, your typical Roman under the expansion of the church, your typical Roman in that world had a concept of fate in their life. Had a concept that there are some actions that the gods had just willed and they were just going to happen to you if you weren't prospering in your, your religion, if, if you weren't prospering in your business, if you weren't prospering in your family. That was probably because the gods had willed it that way and there's nothing you could do about it. But cults spread in the Roman Empire so drastically because they offered people an escape from fate. Usually that escape came through in the Roman Empire through a perverted sexual act or a ceremonial meal or a particular sacrifice at a temple. But notice that it had nothing to do with repentance. And that's, that's still true today. Generally, cults don't have any kind of concept of repentance, humbling your intellect, turning from your sins as much as they do do this, do that, do the other thing. Thirdly, Cults offer assurance of immortality. Assurance of immortality. People don't look forward to death. But what cults do is they offer people eternal security. And generally their eternal security is tailored to their own lusts, their own desires. Offering kind of a catharsis through religious activity. That's what cults do. Now here's the problems with witnessing to cult members. They're usually not open to truth because their whole worldview is built on that they're the only ones with truth. So from the very foundation, a cult member, unlike your average American agnostic or, or whatever, your, very, your average cult member already has his grid where he and the people who taught him are the only ones with truth. So you come from outside of their cult. They, they just don't have a grid for hearing you. They're not open to truth because they alone have it. Often, cult members, this is just as true in the Roman Empire as it is today, often cult members may seem engaged in conversation, 
really just eager to give you a canned response, waiting for a pause. So you can think you're making so much progress with the Mormon missionary at your door. Oh, I'm finally getting through. But he has, you know, he has this canned response. He has his speech. And he's just waiting for the opportunity to press play. And third, cults have an epistemological framework to dismiss your truth. Most cults, ever since the spread of Christianity, most cults in the Western world came into being as a response to Christianity. So because of that, they have a grid for dealing with the Bible truth. So in other words, most cults have their origin in being able to explain why Jesus isn't really God. So the Mormon knows the verses you're going to take him to to prove the deity of Christ, and he already has his response built into him. His religion has that response built from the ground up. They have a framework to dismiss your truth. And that's why when you're evangelizing cult members and people from any religion, essentially, I think often the idea that you should have a gospel presentation tailored for a Mormon or tailored for a Catholic or tailored for a Jehovah's Witness is very easily overplayed. That the reality is the, the cult member is in essentially the same place as your average non-Christian. They have sin. They're clinging to a system that will provide them escape from that. And that system doesn't work. It doesn't actually cleanse their conscience. It offers them the hope of a clear conscience, but it doesn't actually cleanse their conscience. It doesn't change their heart. Cults are incapable of changing the flesh. And so because of that, the basics of the gospel, that, that the scripture is true, that Jesus came and died for sinners and rose from the grave, and that by belief in that, you, belief in that you won't stand for judgment of your sins before God, is still effective with cult members. They may not be open to it, but they're not going to be open to any form of gospel presentation. But the basics of the gospel are usually, I think, more effective often than even a tailored gospel presentation for a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or whatever. Questions on cults before we go back to the spread of evangelism? Yeah. that can change over time from what those three things are saying, like the normal society, that one, because, like, you know, the idea, I don't know, I've heard, like, the cult is just, like, a religion that's kind of, like, a early religion, like, so how, what's the distinction is, say, between, like, a religion and <coughs> how to deal with that, you know? Sure. Andrew's question is, what's the distinction between a religion and a cult and how to deal with that? And does a religion change from being a cult into a, a full-blown religion over time? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's why these, these things, you know, when you read non-Christian books about the origin of Christianity, they often categorize Christianity as a cult because they say it meets these three definitions for a while until Protestant Christianity comes along and loses their infallible leader and becomes more mainstream. But a lot of non-Christians would define Christianity in its early stages as, as a cult from meeting this definition. Uh, you know, it's not mainstream society, right? It was illegal in the Roman Empire, founded by a charismatic leader. And, you know, most non-Christians would say that Jesus was replaced by, you know, borrowing from Roman Catholic theology, Jesus was replaced by, by Peter or whatever. And after a while, Christianity became more mainstream and normalized and lost its distinction as a cult. I could understand why somebody would say that. And I think we see uh, Mormonism, I think, is a great present-day example of that, where 20 years ago, Mormons were definitely a cult. Wacko crazy, not part of our society. Who is that person? Mormons would be embarrassed to let people know that they're Mormon. And Look at how much things have changed now. Yeah, Rich. Point three about cults. Um, you said that, or your syllabus says that, it, you know, the uh, mystery religions offered elements consistent with Christianity. Yeah. Which help prepare people for the gospel. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you see that also as working against Maybe especially nowadays, or as people look at history, and they say, well, lots of religions have stories like that. Sure. The richest question is, under point three in your syllabus about cults, not under the excursus about cults, but under point three of proponents of evangelism, under cults there, it talks about how uh, cults gave the Roman world this 
framework of believing in a God who would suffer and rise from the dead, for example, the rites of baptism, communion, cleansing from sin, immortality through, through belief in God. Those were all not unique to Christianity at that time. They were predominant in several other religions. Well, now the anachronistic CSUN theology professor, the atheist who teaches at most of our public schools, um, teaches undiscerning people who are looking for an excuse to be atheistic, really, they, they jump all over that and say, see, Christianity has no distinction. The idea of Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead was not unique to Christianity. There were all kinds of Roman gods and Roman cultic gods that believed that. Therefore, Christianity isn't true. And I, I don't think that's, that's valid logic, obviously. <laughs> um, it's just it's people that are looking for an excuse not to believe. Um, there's whole frameworks. Probably you're, you're the most common atheistic response if you read uh, Christopher Hitchens or any of the prolific atheistic writers right now is they, they camp on this. They talk about the goddess Dionysus had the same kind of thing that w w you know, was allegedly born to a virgin and stuff. And um, they seize on Christians' ignorance for that to show that Christianity isn't really teaching their people accurate history. Uh, I don't buy that. Those things were predominant through through the Roman Empire, but the uniqueness of Jesus isn't found in those things. It's found in the fulfilling of prophecy and his death and resurrection, like his actual death and resurrection. Um, yeah? I was wondering just um, at its root, I mean, obviously God can and has used these things. He can use whatever he wants, you know, to fulfill his plan and he can work against things that Satan thinks are going to be for his benefit. Mm -hmm. But should we view things like that? <coughs> as satanic counterfeits of the truth, like he knows the truth and knows what it is, and he inserts those things to cast doubt and make people go, yeah, right, this is just another fairy tale or something. Sure. Rich's question, should we view cults as a satanic counterfeit of, of the truth? And, and definitely, yeah. All false religions have as their head Satan. And his ways are, are myriad. He'll have false religions that don't look anything like Christianity. He'll have false religions that look almost exactly like Christianity, just all you have to, you know, faith in Christ plus this one little ritual right here. So he, the full rainbow of false religions exists in our world, and Satan is behind all of them, I think. So there's no problem with viewing any false religion as having Satan as its head and being a demonic counterfeit of the truth. Because all religion has as its goal the same thing, to, to lure people away from from the God of, of Scripture, from the Creator God. Yeah. You said something really interesting about the basics of the gospel rather than uh, our own kind of uh, apologetic approach to Jehovah's Witnesses at the door or Mormons where we tailor the gospel to a specific area of debate about the deity of Christ. Um, that's interesting um, because I think that is our tendency, right? We think that that's, we've always, at least I was taught that way in the churches I went to that was more effective that you really not just learn the theology so you can understand where a point of contact is, but like present these arguments for the deity of Christ with people and just take them to these specific verses, argue that, and not really approach the gospel as a whole. Yeah, that's, you know, on the one hand, on the one hand, you, your point of evangelism is always attacking the area of disbelief. Okay, so your starting point, the, in order to get somebody to humble themselves to the lie and, and turn and face the truth, you have to attack their area of unbelief. So with Mormons, their area of unbelief is the legion. There's so many areas that the Mormons would, would diverge from biblical Christianity. One of them is the deity of Christ. So you could go down that road and out the gate and go after that. I'm wondering about the effectiveness of that because Mormons generally are equipped to have answers for that approach. Um, so they're not, they're not going to go for it. Uh, so on the one hand, you want to attack the area of disbelief. But on the other hand, your common point, your starting point in all evangelistic encounters is the person is made in the image of God, made for the purpose of glorifying God, and is loving sin and serving a lie rather than the creator. So, yeah. Yeah. The gospel, your argument. You've got your Greek New Testament out with the Jehovah's Witness saying, look, <laughs> there's no article there. <laughs> Can't believe they didn't convert. <laughs> Alpha privative and everything. Okay. 
<laughs> proponents of evangelism. Uh, there's the Greek culture. There was also dispersion. The Jews were scattered around the Roman Empire. And this is even before the time of Christ. You see this from James 1.1. 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. About 10% of the Roman population was Jewish. About 10% of the Roman population was Jewish. And only about half of those were in Israel. So there were almost as many Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire as there were in Israel during the time of Christ. What these Jews did was they established synagogues wherever they went. However, they not only established synagogues, they conducted those, those worship services in Greek. They didn't meet in their synagogues in Aramaic. They met in Greek. The result of that is through the Roman Empire, you have synagogues scattered everywhere where people are coming together to worship God in the Greek language. Which means that non-Jews could attend a synagogue and understand the message. Now, non-Jews did not flock to, to synagogues yet. But when Paul and when the gospel expands and when the people in the synagogues come to Christ, that became the foundation of the church. And non-Christians, I mean Gentiles, would come to the synagogues then and they could hear the truth in Greek. And that's why in Acts 15, when it talks about should we command the Gentiles to obey the law of Moses, their, their answer is no, because after all, the law of Moses is read every Sabbath in the synagogues anyway, meaning that the Gentile believers would still be hearing it. So you have these synagogues that are established in Greek, scattered around the Roman Empire, which have introduced the Greek mind to monotheism, so Greeks are already conditioned to understand that there are some people that believe in one God who rules the world, not the pantheon. I mean, Romans never really did understand the Jews. Right? They, they accused the Jews of being atheists for worshiping God they couldn't see, etc. But because of the predominance of Jews, it made the idea of monotheism more mainstream in the Roman Empire. Apart from Judaism, this is where exclusivism comes in, apart from Judaism, there was no other religion in the world that wouldn't make room for other religions. Judaism was the only, world, the only religion in the entire world that was exclusive. And this, again, had a conditioning effect on the Roman mind to get them to understand that there are at least people in the world that believe in absolute truth and that other religions are false. Before the, before the spread of Judaism around the Roman Empire, people viewed gods as just a battle of who was stronger. It wasn't like the Egyptian gods were weaker than the Greek, or were not true and the Greek gods were true. It was that the Greek gods were stronger than the Egyptian gods and that's why they were conquered. But here come the Jews that say all of your gods aren't true. It has nothing to do with strength. It's an issue of veracity. So this prepared the way for the spread of evangelism by conditioning Greeks to understand that there are people that believe in only one God and that that God is exclusive and giving them a, a vehicle, the synagogues, to have worship for that God. And then finally, the, the biggest proponent of evangelism, which I don't think this is in your notes, but was legalization in 312. Legalization in 312 under Constantine, which finally freed churches to do their evangelism publicly. And that's where the spread of Christianity was accelerated. Before 312, it was still, Christianity was somewhat influential in pockets in Egypt and in Turkey, but it was not nearly as widespread as it became after 312 when churches were allowed to make disciples publicly. There were also opponents of evangelism, though. There were things that were set up as stumbling blocks. To balance, I want to look at those. The first is Jewish antagonism. In the Jewish mind, Christian missionaries were nobodies. They were the weakest of the weak, the lowest of the lows. You couldn't find anybody in, in the Jewish society more despised than missionaries. 
In fact, it's pretty fair to say all of the things that we think about tax collectors in the New Testament, how despised tax collectors were, when you left the area of Jerusalem and Israel, that's how Jews viewed Rome, uh, Christian missionaries. As traitors to the faith, as claiming to believe in their God, but being so far outside of, of the real religion to not even be tolerated. And you can trace this through the book of Acts. They were punished and, well, arrested in Acts 4. We read that this morning. Punished in Acts 5. Stoned to death in Acts 6 and 7. Persecuted and scattered in Acts 8 and 9. James was beheaded in Acts 12. Paul was rejected by the Jewish leaders publicly and formally in Acts 13. Jews, were blame, Jews blamed the Christians for the for the burning of Rome, got Nero to turn against Christians and outlaw them. Church history says that the Jews were the ones that gathered the wood for Polycarp, Polycarp's burning in AD 165. Tertullian and Origen both wrote that the persecution they faced from the Romans paled in comparison to the relentless enmity of the Jews. And that's, of course, because Christ was the stumbling block. They couldn't come to terms with, with that. They couldn't come to terms with the idea that God became man. Second, Greek skepticism. Greek skepticism. The Jews were opposed violently. The Greeks were just scoffing skeptically. Greeks thought of truth in terms of universals. In other words, Greeks thought in terms of truth in terms of universal concepts that were true around the world. So Christianity, for Christianity to proclaim exclusive belief in one God who became localized in the flesh at one point in the world was contrary to Greek thought. When Greeks heard of the plurality of the Godhead, they assumed polytheism. Christian refusal to participate in pagan culture made them outcasts from the Greeks as well. So the new church, the fledging church, is exiled from the Jewish community and exiled from the Greek community. Plus they face severe persecution from the Romans. Roman persecution that was severe. For almost 250 years, Christians lived with a standing death order over them. For 250 years, starting around 70 AD, from that point forward, to be a Christian publicly was to seal your own death warrant. Try doing evangelism in that kind of environment. <laughs> the phrase sinner's prayer takes on a, a different connotation. At the start, by the way, Christian religion was viewed by the Romans as being a Jewish sect. And so because of that, the Jews were given a lot of freedom in the Roman Empire. So Christians had that same kind of freedom and were free to operate under the same freedom that the Jews had. Until they started making converts of Gentiles. And once that happened, that's when Nero and the Roman government could look and see that this is not Judaism. Nero did not learn to distinguish between Jews and Christians based on fine points of theology. He learned to distinguish between Jews and Christians because the Jews didn't proselytize Greeks. Nero didn't care. Caesar didn't care. Whoever the emperor was didn't care about Judaism expanding because they weren't after Gentiles. But when Christianity began to target Gentiles, it drew the attention of the Roman government and became banned. It was viewed as a threat to the state. They were called atheists, of course, for not believing in a God that could be seen. That's so why when you read the book of Acts and you see Paul's trial, you see Festus and Felix <laughs> listening to Paul talk and just shaking their heads and going, this is some, they're talking, you get the backroom picture of them talking to each other. This is some kind of dispute among Jews. We don't care about this. Well, that, that apathy did not last for long. And finally, as the Roman Empire began to collapse, belief was placed squarely, blame was placed squarely at the feet of the Jews and of the Christians. Christians were blamed for the collapse of the Roman Empire. 
Rome viewed themselves kind of in the, with a sense of inevitability that a lot of Americans have, that, you know, greatest country ever will be here forever, you know, thousands of years, this country will still be the strongest nation on the earth. That's the way the Greeks viewed their own country. That's the way the Romans viewed the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Empire collapse was extremely fast in the scale of history. It unraveled, it collapsed, Rome fell dramatically fast. And people started asking, what has changed? What changed? And the answer that most people came up with was Christianity. Beyond that, there was doctrinal division. The Christian witness was devastated in the first few hundred years by their own doctrinal divisions. Huge debates about whether or not Christians should cling to Jewish traditions, the humanity of Christ, the deity of Christ, Things that we take as just basic Christianity. So much so, if somebody says, I don't believe in the humanity of Christ, you say you're not a Christian. Case closed. Somebody else comes along and says, I don't believe in the deity of Christ. Well, you need the gospel. Let me evangelize you. Imagine with Christianity spreading so quickly around the empire with those basic questions not settled. What does evangelism look like then? Some people who don't believe Jesus is human. Some people who don't believe that he was God. You had... You know, the charismatic chaos of TBN paled in comparison to the charismatic chaos of around the year 300, 400. You had people who were believing continuing revelation, ongoing revelation, messages from God. You had those people inserting their divine revelations and messages into doctrinal controversies. Oh, God told me that Jesus was a man. Undermining the authority of Scripture. The date of Easter was one of the biggest doctrinal disputes in the early church. People called heretics, anathematized over it. The date of Easter. And look at what they came up with. One of the most ludicrous systems ever. Any questions on the spread of Christianity for those first few hundred years? I'm going to trust you guys will talk about more about this in church history that you already did about Constantine's conversion, big quotes and how that influenced evangelism. What I want you to get from this is just, there is evidential power in these things. But beyond that, I want you to understand the providence and the sovereignty of God and how he orchestrated world history to usher in Christ and the spread of the gospel.